Deutero Isaiah, chapters 52 and 53, a rapid overview in August of 2023. My learning objectives for today are to outline this text, to identify who is my servant, then to describe the servant's deeds, his works, to affirm substitutionary atonement, and then relate this to Jesus and the New Testament. Now, the text itself is subject to various kinds of analyses. One of the most common ways in which biblical writers organize their materials was in what we call today a chiastic structure. A passage will open with a statement. For example, my servant shall prosper. And it will say something about that. Who has believed our report? Then he grew up, he was wounded, we have gone astray. At this point then, we work our way back out of the passage in reverse order. The Lord laid on him, he was oppressed. D was he was wounded, now D prime, he was oppressed. He was taken away after growing up. It was the will of the Lord who has believed our report, and then I will allot to him a portion. My servant shall prosper. Now, if you're watching for these kinds of structures, they're rather common throughout the scripture. In many of the Proverbs, for example, they look like they're presented in completely random fashion, but once you discern the chiasms, many of them fit into this passage presents some interpretive difficulties, to say the least. What some point out is there is no identifiable historical context, persons, places, or events that match the passage. And so you're left wondering whom or what was this talking about? Others <clears throat> insist that there are some rather strange allusions to marred leaders, substitutionary deaths, prolonged lives after death, what? This is bizarre. And so they're wondering, what is this alluding to? And some suggesting this actually could not have been an, an ancient text. It must have been a rather recent origin, although no more recently than about 100 BC. Then you have, if this is servant is Israel, Israel seems to be suffering on its own behalf and somehow benefiting other nations. Well, of course, we Jews, we have suffered more than any other race on earth, and we exist only for your benefit. There is no recorded fulfillment of this passage in the Tanakh. In other words, it was, it was said, but we don't see it happening. And of course, it's uh, been misappropriated by Christians to refer to Jesus. Well, let's ask. Who is the servant? Possibilities that have been presented. First, this could have been Isaiah himself or some contemporary. Why else would he mention it? Secondly, others say, well, this is some former prophet, such as Moses or Jeremiah. One of the ancient prophets come back somehow. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Of course, many Jews say this is the nation of Israel or some, rhino, some righteous minority within Israel. And then there's the position, well, this was ideal Israel. This is what God intended Israel to be, but they messed up. Or another messianic figure. And some actually Jewish community said this. Since this hasn't happened yet, it must be referred to the Messiah. He will accomplish these things when he comes. And that led to a doctrine of two messiahs, a suffering messiah and a reigning messiah. Jewish. In the Jewish community, there are those who hold to that. One they call the son of David, the other they call the son of Joseph. And then, of course, there are the early messianic movement in Palestinian Judaism was that this is the New Testament Jesus. Anyway, let's uh, go into the text. If we just keep moving today, we could actually cover all the verses. My servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, lifted up and shall be very high. 
Just as there were many who were, were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance mm -hmm. and his form beyond that of mortals. Here we have a meeting of a couple of figures, that both of whom look like kings. During the Babylonian Akitu festival at the New Year, the king was required to take the hand of Bel, or Baal, Marduk, and proclaim his innocence as a righteous monarch. On the fifth day of the 11-day festival, the king was taken before the high priest, who stripped the monarch of his royal insignias, his mace, his loop, his scepter, and struck him on the cheeks. The priest then dragged the king by his ears and forced him to bow down to the ground before Marduk, as he again proclaimed his innocence. Now, this was a well-known festival. This was something that was done to the king, which left him looking in a rather sorry state. And so some have said the idea of an exalted king being marred and reduced to a pulp, so to speak, was not unknown. Was not unknown? Yeah. In other words, they did this ceremonially during the, uh, this annual festival. I find that hard to believe that a king would, would have submitted something. Well, they did. <laughs> okay. And it was, again, it was to show that I am completely innocent. You can beat me up, throw me down on the ground in front of the God. I am innocent. So shall, so he shall starve many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths because for that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Startle many nations? When would a king ever shut his mouth? Priest was slapping him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kings were, anyway, this term, he shall startle, the Hebrew means to ritually sprinkle. This is the term that's used of sprinkling blood from an offering on things that have to be purified. But the, so the Septuagint, the Greek version, translated it, many nations will be amazed at him. Going from the Septuagint, others have said, well, instead of sprinkling, apparently this must have meant something like uh, to be amazed. So he will startle or amaze other nations. He's going to accomplish things that no one else had ever heard of. But who has believed our report? Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Right. Who is speaking here? Have any ideas? Isaiah. Well, I would, Isaiah is writing it down, or someone else is a contemporary of Isaiah whose writing has been attached to first Isaiah's writings, but he is relating the speech of somebody. The first verse was, behold my servant, that's Yahweh speaking, but now somebody else is speaking because Yahweh goes into the third person. To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Of course, an arm is a show of strength. Be his son Jesus, he's not going to be. Definitely the New Testament is going to apply it to Jesus. They did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Mm -hmm. All right, so this, uh, this was interpreted by uh, John, the Apostle John to mean that Nobody believed it at the time, and applied to the New Testament period, they didn't believe in him. Who was speaking here? John, John, the, John the Gospel writer. Yes. I am as perplexed as the ancient writers. One of the ways to really get into scripture is to pretend you're not a Christian for a moment. Pretend you're an ancient Jew, and you're reading these scriptures for the first time, and ask yourself, what would this mean to me? Earlier in, in the Old Testament, yeah. Messiah is, where does Messiah first start showing up? In Isaiah, or the prophets? Or? 
Well, if you take the later Old Testament writers, reading and interpreting the earlier Old Testament writers, it seems to have started in Genesis chapter 3. Looking carefully at how the scripture interprets scripture, that theme of someone who was going to suffer in order to gain victory over the devil as part of restoring Eden started very early. He grew up before him. Who grew up before whom? Verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. You ever had a corner of your garden that never quite got watered? <laughs> and when stuff springs up, what does it look like? looks thirsty. So as this individual is growing up apparently before Yahweh, nothing, nothing noteworthy at first, nothing desirable. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Again, strange language. What is it doing there? Why was this written? Whom was it talking about? Uh, if, you, if you never knew such an individual or heard about such an individual, you would be, you'd be left wondering. A common Jewish interpretation is this is not talking about an individual. This is talking about a nation. Or in other words, they'd say this was Judah coming out of Babylon, all beaten down. But was it common? at the time to speak of a nation as an individual person? <clears throat> or did, did they assume that uh, they were talking about Joseph, Israel, the, Joseph's father? That's, an, that's a question to pose. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. The, dec the Decalogue, for example, the Ten Commandments, are all addressed to the second person singular. But who is to obey it? The whole nation was to obey it. But if this is talking about an individual, then this is somebody who suffered a lot. Was Jesus ever sick, pointed with infirmity? Well, on the cross he was. Oh, we don't know. Uh, well, the uh, uh, religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, opposed him from day one. Yeah. If we're talking about Jesus, he became very familiar with our diseases. He healed a lot of folk. Well, he was wounded. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Yeah, beaten down by God. Well, was Israel ever beaten down by God? You could make that association here. Now the New Testament writers also had something to say about this. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Thank you Jesus. But in this case, how was it fulfilled? Did Jesus get sick? He became a, a, a substitutionary atonement. However, the, the text itself in Matthew <laughs> applies this to his healing ministry. Jesus didn't suffer because he deserved it. I mean, Jesus suffered because he loved us. I mean, that, I think there's a little mm -hmm. rub for me in that scripture. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we don't deserve anything, but it's because of God's great love that he sent his son for us to mm -hmm. suffer for us. And Isaiah 53, 4, 6, it says, uh, tells us Jesus' suffering was unjust, unfair, uncruel. He didn't deserve it. Um, those who inflicted his wounds were the ones who deserved it. Right. Jesus took the punishment to pay the price for what they were doing to him. Yeah. They too were included in the list of yeah. the ones who for Christ died, as we are today. Yeah. So in our African village, there was a lot of talk about healing of diseases, but there was very little healing of diseases. Mm. One of the questions that comes up in, amongst interpreters what would taking away of diseases actually meant? In antiquity, 
when there was no effective medical service. Some still ask that. The Ugaritic myth of the struggle of Baal and Mort contains the story of the story of the Rapiuma, meaning saviors or healers, led by Baal, who had risen from the dead. That was a doctor in the ancient antiquity. <clears throat> that there had actually been a battle between a couple of gods, Baal and Mot, which is Semitic word for death. These venerated ancestors were believed to intervene on behalf of the living. They healed mortals' diseases, helped in matters of fertility, and protected them against the evils of society. The Rapiuma, however, did not take the infirmities of the mortals upon themselves. So, there was a belief in the possibility of healing coming from the gods, but the gods didn't suffer to make it happen. They were also very capricious. You didn't know whether you'd get a healing or not. Uh -huh. it, but it says here that uh, Baal uh, rose from the dead, and didn't what? that in some way take care of uh, some of this? So, some are suggesting that Isaiah, the context of Isaiah was this myth that we're talking about a servant who is somehow equivalent to the god Baal or the Rapiuma. The point is, ancients understood healing, even if they didn't get much of it. They were hoping for it. And of course, as one doctor friend put it to me, he said, Three quarters of all my patients will get well without my treatment. But they come to me, so I treat them anyway. And he was quite frank. He said, it's my bread and butter. <laughs> that other quarter really needed his help. <laughs> Your bread and butter comes from Jesus. Amen. Uh, the god Baal, as portrayed often in antiquity, in his right hand he holds a thunderbolt because he was a, a god of storms amongst under other things. And by, he had to conquer death in order to become the chief, the chief over the other gods, even though he himself was a creation of the god El, which was also the god of the Bible. All right, he was wounded. But he was wounded for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that was made, that made us whole. And by his bruises, we were healed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, again, you, you would be left wondering in ancient <clears throat> times, whom is this possibly talking about? It's hard to put us back to that time and look at it like that when we know what we know now. Yeah. yeah. And so me, I just, I praise the Lord for that scripture. Because now, animal sacrifices in one way or another could be envisioned here, but... The, when did the beasts become the servants of Yahweh? It's, uh, so it's all very perplexing. Oh, unless, of course, you read the New Testament. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have. The New Testament is very, very clear. Jesus fulfilled literally, in detail, yes. all the prophecies of these, these chapters. Yes, yes. Now, Substitutionary atonement. Others say, well, in the Old Testament, there is no substitutionary atonement. Well, actually there is, but if you didn't understand that, there was also a doctrine of substitutionary atonement in pagan society. When evil omens, especially an eclipse of the sun or the moon, suggested that the life of the king was in danger, the king was temporarily replaced by a substitute 
on whom the evil fate would fall. Oh, this is where the fall guy came from. So, right. <laughs> During this time, the real king was kept in relative isolation of virtual exile and participated in numerous purification rituals. Meanwhile, the substitute was going through the motions of being a king and sitting on the throne. Uh, I left out some of the text, suggesting that they probably chose someone who was feeble-minded, who actually could sit on the throne and clap his hands. But at the end of the period, the substitute was murdered. In other words, <laughs> he died that the king might live. Aztec, Mayan. Uh, uh, human sacrifice. Human. That's not unknown. So point E, we have gone astray. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. Since uh, sheep had to be continually moved, they were not kept in well-fenced pastures. They tended to um, go astray. Just like us. <laughs> but it says right here, we have all turned to our own way. So, what was the answer to that? It's all in one sentence. It's all right there in the middle of the chiasm. <laughs> kind of sums up the whole text. Now, this would have been applied first. We all, meaning all of us Israelites, or all of us Judeans, who had gone astray, had to be exiled for a while, but we're now being redeemed. We're being brought oh. back into the land because the Lord laid our iniquity on someone else. And I see the Lord here, and it's definitely not talking about this. It's talking about God. So, yeah, yeah. So, Lord in capital letters is Yahweh. Okay. Yeah, sometimes, if thinking, if you're from a Trinitarian perspective, Yahweh is sometimes the Father, other times Yahweh is the Son, and yet in other texts, Yahweh is. So, uh, yeah, there are reasons from the Old Testament that we demonstrated in our course on the supernatural that the angel of the Lord was Yahweh who could actually speak with Yahweh. Anyway. Oh, did you see that black sheep go by? I did. <laughs> I did. You know who that is. That's Chuck. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. A lamb that is led to the slaughter, why doesn't it put up more of a fuss? doesn't know what's going on. That's right. And why is the sheep silent before it's shearers? Still doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> but if it's ever been sheared before, oh, man. it knows that, whew, I'm going to be rid of this summer heat now. Real. There's, there's a New Testament text. Yeah, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was, quote, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb son before it's sheared, so he does not open his mouth. Okay. So who was speaking when the, in that text? Recall from Acts chapter 8? This was an Ethiopian government official, apparently a proselyte to Judaism. He had been to Jerusalem, and he had come with plenty of money, and he was able to buy himself a copy of the book of Isaiah. And he was so delighted that he was reading it on his way <laughs> back from Jerusalem, headed probably back to Ethiopia, or Upper Egypt, whatever the text was talking about. This is the text that he was reading. And the Holy Spirit had said to Philip, yeah, to go meet this chap, heard him reading the text, and asked, do you understand what you're talking, what, what you're reading? How can I? So, if it was perplexing for him, you know why it was perplexing to virtually everybody until the evangelist came along and said, well, let me tell you about who this was. And he preached Jesus. Ancient Near East texts often describe the shearing of sheep who underwent their lot in silence. Shearing was done annually in the spring using shears, which were invented about 1000 BC. An individual could shear 20 or 30 shears a day. This, as an image, this was well known. So when did Isaiah write? 
Remember what century? It's about 8th century. Uh, second Isaiah, probably, perhaps 7th or even part of early in the 6th century BC. Last time I went to a barber shop was before my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my wife a, a pair of shears. She, and I'm silent before her. <laughs> yes. I like her price. <laughs> he was taken away, verse 8. He was taken away from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, was he stricken. Right. He was stricken for the transgression of my people. If I were an ancient Jew, I would be thinking only of one thing here. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Uh, this text was being quoted by the Ethiopian official. He was just as perplexed as anyone else. Oh, do you, do you enjoy textual variants? <laughs> Where it says, stricken for the transgression of my people, the Masoretic text actually reads, uh, my people, an affliction for him. My people is a singular noun, but it's what we call a collective noun. It's talking in singular form, talking about many. And so the pronoun, affliction for him, just simply is grammatically agrees with my people. But we understand it to be plural in meaning. And so the translators, they just avoided the pronoun entirely. Oh, I like that part. Yeah, and just simply says, stricken for the transgression of my people. As you, when you're a translator, you try to make things clear without altering the message. Sometimes you have to fudge a little on the meaning. So, what did the Dead Sea Scroll say? It corrected it by changing one letter. My people part becomes uh, afflicted. What did the Greeks do with this? He was led to death, apparently from a lost Hebrew document that had a T at the end of the word, changing it to mot, the same word used in the Ugaritic text for Baal's battle with mot. So he was led to death. So when the New Testament translation differs from the First Testament text, at least the way it's translated, how do we, how do we deal with this? Well, sometimes it just may be an allusion or a paraphrase. Do you ever do that? Do you ever paraphrase a Bible text to make it sound more acceptable or so it makes sense to your children? You see, every English translation is a paraphrase. You simply cannot follow the original wording and make sense of it. Seminary students do that, but then they go off and try to preach their wooden translations and it doesn't get very far. So they're either dismissed to go find a real job or they, they learn to use the standard translations. Secondly, it may be due to an Old Testament manuscript variant, some of which we still have, others of which have been lost or corrected or miscorrected. It could be, and this is usually the case in the New Testament, it's quoted from the Septuagint. The New Testament very seldom ever quotes the Hebrew Bible. It just simply uses the, the standard Greek text because most Jews at the time could read Greek if they were educated and had more difficulty with Hebrew. That, all right, other times, it may be quoted from a non-biblical Jewish source. Can you think of one? Other times it's a quotation from the, the Apocrypha. Which by some was, was assumed to be part of the scripture. Historically, Jews, some Jews and many Christians said, well, the Apocrypha, well, we would call the Apocrypha today. They just said, well, this is part of the Bible. The reason they said that was Jews accepted the Greek portions of their scripture as scripture. 
Now, eventually, the Jews dropped the Septuagint translation entirely. Why? Because the Christians had taken it over. They said, what? Well, huh? If the Messianics are using our Greek scriptures now, we'll stop using the Greek scriptures. So they did. And they went back to dealing only with the Hebrew text. And eventually, when translations were made for the Christians, the early ones included the Apocrypha. That was the Protestant Bible for centuries. Somewhere along the way, the conservative branch of Protestantism decided, well, we should follow the Jewish example. We will just accept the Hebrew scriptures as inspired. And so we stopped publishing the Apocrypha in our Bibles. Roman Catholic Bibles to this day include the Apocryphal books. Although many Christian Catholics will say, well, no, they're not inspired in the same way the rest of the Bible is, but this has been our Bible forever. The fact that you Protestant pigs started chopping off part of the Bible doesn't mean we have to. By the way, it's, it's in the Orthodox Bible. It may be a New Testament manuscript copyist's mistake. Or it may be an English translator's style or conjecture. Many uh, are current English translations of the New Testament and the Old actually have conjectures, meaning we, this is what we guess the original probably said. Do you reckon that maybe these translation problems is one of the reasons that Islam uh, doesn't want uh, the Quran translated into any language other than Arabic? Well, they actually do translate it into all other languages. Well, I know, but, but I mean, it's not a frown upon it. It's, well, no, it's not a, they're not, translations are not accepted as authoritative, only the Arabic. It's interesting, though, uh, there is more than one Arabic dialect in those documents, which suggests different authors. And scholars of the Quran to this day <clears throat> seem to be suggesting that there was no Muhammad that the Arabs were collecting Christian and Christian uh, heretics were writing their own documents from memory. This is why the Quran mostly talks about Jesus more than any other person and bases itself upon the earlier prophets, seven of whom biblical prophets are named. <clears throat> and so the Quran was probably early Christian and Christian heretic writings that were translated either into Arabic or were written in Arabic or in other Semitic languages, which were just assumed to be dialects of Arabic. Our, our Muslim friends, their, their book has its own textual problems that are more bizarre than our own. Uh, the one thing that we are willing to do is to admit, yeah, we have, we have some textual problems, but we deal with them. We try to deal with them honestly. They don't. So after a couple of centuries, they rounded up all, their, all, the, various, all the, variant, the different texts that they had, decided which ones to keep, and they burned the rest of them, and ordered that all variant Korans be burned. And then they changed, they came up with a new doctrine. This book came down out of heaven, verbatim, through angels. And Muhammad simply wrote them down, and there is no variation. You, your Bible obviously is an inferior book because it has variations. Ours is perfect. <laughs> However, they didn't do a really, really good job of it because old variant versions have been uncovered over the last, especially the last couple of decades through archaeology. All right, what we have here is a uh, turn of the century, past century photograph of tombs of the rich. Some were very rich, others were, you have the tomb of David is one of those. He made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. All right, this is cited in the New Testament. Christ also suffered for you. You should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, 
and no deceit was found in his mouth. Okay, right. Yeah, whom did Jesus ever beat up? The money king. <laughs> he, he, he didn't beat now, he beat up a few folk verbally, yeah. Yeah. but he was very truthful in doing so. He didn't lie about them. So, yeah, this is Jesus was buried amongst the tombs of the rich. Where were those located? They were not located inside Jerusalem. All of the touristic sites about the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus in Jerusalem, it's all fake. Whoa. It's supported, it's propped up by the really? Israel Tourist Board because most tourists are too lazy to walk up onto the Mount of Olives where the crucifixion took place and the burial. I that, thought the Mount of Olives was was the Mount of Olives, and, the, and he was buried, he was crucified on the place of the skull. Yeah, but that little mound that looks like a skull, if you find older photographs of it, it looked different from today. And if you go back farther, there were no holes in the mound. In the first century, it did not look like a skull. But there is a place on top of the Mount of Olives that historically was called the skull because it was the rounded top of the mountain. And the Hebrew was Golgotha, which is actually cited in the Hebrew Bible, where David went up on the Mount of Olives to Golgotha. Anyway, it's a fascinating <coughs> study. Uh, a lot of Christianity is fake. All right. They're pretty good about that. They're not saying a possible site. Yes. They say it's a possible site. Possible site. Possible site. Well, I would counter and say it's not a possible site. There's no evidence for it. Stop it. Anyway, there's a textual variant where it says they made his grave, the Masoretic text and the Aramaic Targum say, his deaths. It's a plural, which could be a Hebrew way of saying a violent death. So Dead Sea Scroll says his burial mound which is kind of interesting. That suggests in the dirt rather than a tomb. <clears throat> so the Septuagint in the Latin actually say his death, not grave, in the singular. So apparently ancient scribes mistook this word his mound, B-M-H, for his death, B-M-T. So bamach or bamat would have sounded pretty similar. I'm getting to the end of the chiasm now. And it was the will of the Lord to crush him with affliction. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering and shall prolong his days. Through him will, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Right. When you make his life, did any of your versions say something else there? Anyway, the Hebrew says, if she, we don't know what to do with that, other textual variants, where it says, with affliction, Masoretic text actually says, made him sick. Remember, he bore diseases. Uh, the Septuagint said, well, with a plague. The Greek word is plague. Another old Greek translation by Aquila says, with the illness. Apparently had some particular illness in mind. Maybe the one quoted earlier. Dead Sea Scrolls says, and wounded him. So, take your choice. Uh, one little word about guilt offerings in the Hebrew Bible. Reparation, sometimes the, the offerings called guilt offering are called by scholars. Reparation offerings function to reset relations following a violation of terms of a covenant. Bloody sacrifices serve to purify sacred space. That is, wherever Yahweh met with his people. So you'd use blood to purify an altar, the tabernacle, the temple, uh, the community, even, even the books. These were a temporary measure required until Messiah died for us. So thenceforth, the way into the holy places is cleansed by his blood. And so the Old Testament sacrifices actually did nothing for the, for the offender. Sacrifices of but it was our sinful way of life that defiled the sacred places. And so they had to annually 
be cleansed, or uh, in many cases, as frequently as you felt you needed it. However, for personal crimes, murders and apostasies and adulteries and thefts, there was no Old Testament sacrifice. You were thrown upon the mercies of God. New Testament, however, personal sins are covered as well because they're personally defiling. It was the will of the Lord. Out of his anguish, he shall see. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. It's kind of a strange sentence. Anyway, the find satisfaction part. There's Jesus risen from the dead. Do you think he felt satisfied? The suffering was all over. Textual variant, he shall see. Masoretic text in most versions, that's what it actually says. So why did the three Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah, plus the Greek Septuagint reads, he shall see light. Because God is light and God mm -hmm. is no darkness at all. Now the verb to see requires an object. Just, I saw, if I say, I saw, you want to know what, what whether it's, you're talking about carpentry or, or, or vision. And so apparently some versions added an object. He saw light. Since these are old versions and the Hebrew itself requires an object, it looks like the versions actually retained the earlier Hebrew version or Hebrew uh, meaning. And so they proposed translating, he shall see the light of life. The meaning doesn't change. All right, last line. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. He shall bear the iniquities. Therefore, I will not have a portion with the great. He shall divide his spoil. Amen. I will not him a portion because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And Luke, the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted amongst the lawless. And what is written about me is being fulfilled. If Jesus himself applied the text to himself, you know, he's my authority. I came to the scriptures because first I came to Jesus. Oops, there is a textual variant for the transgressors. Masoretic text, that's exactly what it says. So why did three Dead Sea Scrolls say for their transgressions? It's a variant. So the Greek Septuagint, because of their transgressions, the Greek uses, Greek has more prepositions than Hebrew. <clears throat> it seems that the more ancient manuscripts and the different text types argue for the noun transgressions. Text type meaning probably from different Hebrew sources. So whether you translate it transgressions or, or transgressors, it's still us, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I believe is the very least that we can say regarding the relation between Isaiah and Jesus. First, Yahweh's servant is the highest title that he bestows on any earthly being. Hey, if I'm Yahweh's servant, I outrank the rest of you. So Yahweh had several servants, by the by. Israel was one. Some patriarchs, for example, Abraham and Jacob are called servants of the Lord. Some of the kings, such as David, priests. Often the Old Testament talks about my servants, the prophets and certain other righteous folk, and the expected Messiah. So this phrase, servant of the Lord, or servants of the Lord, occurs 113 times in the Old Testament and 11 times in the New Testament. His servant Israel, however, failed in every way. And Jesus has fulfilled all that Yahweh foretold about his servant, Isaiah. I mean, that's where we are. I think that's the least we can say. So, was Isaiah talking about Jesus? Yes, I believe so. Well, Jesus, Isaiah was talking about a servant of the Lord doing things that no one else ever did. When Jesus came along, he did it. 
So Jesus fulfilled the the, uh, the predictions. Did he do it knowingly, or I mean, purposefully, or was that no, the way knowingly? Yeah. I think so because he said right there, "This scripture must be fulfilled in me." He was counted amongst the lawless, and what is written about me is being fulfilled. Uh, well, I say, did he do these things knowing that it was going? I mean, for the purpose of fulfilling prophecy, or did these things happen to him in the course of, of normal events? I, I suspect both <laughs> that there were some things that uh, he had authority over or control over that fulfilled uh, uh, prophecy. But there were other prophecies over which he had no authority or right. control yeah. and was done to him right. beyond his control. Yeah. But he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. He said, the Son of Man is going to be arrested, beaten, crucified. Yes. Yes. There are some historical improbabilities in this Christian artwork. Can you see what any of them are? Not bloody oh. enough. His body isn't dis disfigured enough. Yeah, it could be beaten a little more badly. It should be more bloodier. The thief on the left has an insignia on his cross. It, it doesn't, but then it was it was usual practice to post the accusation on a cross. In other words, we want to frighten everybody. You do this, and this is what we will do to you. Oh, if they start doing that nowadays, people will stop stealing stuff. <laughs> okay, all right. Two, two things that I noticed. First, the guys are wearing pants. That's the second is, all Christian art has the crosses sticking way up in the air. If you've ever worked with lumber and tried to stick up a pole, what will happen? If you put any kind of weight on it, it's got to, it will fall over. Crosses were not known to fall over very often. You know why? It died very deep. Well, you, first, yeah, you make it deep enough. But secondly, the feet of the crucified is only a few centimeters off the ground. In other words, they were ground level. Why? First, the cross wouldn't fall over. And secondly, so the dogs 